afternoon and welcome to the 2018 uh, Pennsylvania Community on Tra Transition webinar series. Uh, my name is Ryan Romanowski from the uh, Patton Harrisburg office. I am on the Secondary Transition Initiative and I am uh, filling in for Hillary Mangus today who was our Secondary Transition State Lead. Uh, unfortunately, because of a conflict in her schedule today, she was unable to be here. So I um, am filling in uh, for her as the patent um, representative today. Um, this webinar is being brought to you by the Pennsylvania Community on Transition and on behalf of the PA Community on Transition, I want to thank you for joining us. The Pennsylvania Community on Transition is a group of various stakeholders from across Pennsylvania who work collaboratively to ensure appropriate transition outcomes for Pennsylvania youth and young adults. The PA uh, Community on Transition is a state leadership team consisting of representatives and representatives from the State Departments of Education, Health, Labor and Industry, and Human Services. Also various serving agencies, young adults, parent organizations, advocates, higher education, and employers. The shared vision and common goals of the Pennsylvania Community on Transition is achieved when all PA youth and young adults with disabilities successfully transition to the role of productive and participating adult citizens are empowered to recognize their talents, strengths, and, voice, and have equal access to resources that will promote their full participation in the communities of their choice. This webinar series is designed to assist individuals of all abilities to think about life experiences needed to move ahead in life. Throughout the series, a cross-agency panel, including the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation, or OVR, the Office of Developmental Programs, or ODP, and the Pennsylvania Youth Leadership Network, also known as the PYLN, representatives will provide participants with information on what IEP teams and students need to know and do regarding setting a vision for a meaningful life. Also identify how to find or develop supports and discover what it takes for students to live the lives they want to live. Um, the majority of or what these webinar series will cover mm -hmm. is the charting the life course, um, and the lifecoursetools.com. And the life, uh, Charting the Life course is a project of the University of Missouri, Kansas City Institute for Human Development. Missouri's University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities Education, Research and Services, and endorsed by the Pennsylvania Department of Health and Human Services, and supported by the Pennsylvania Community on Tr Transition. As I mentioned at the uh, very beginning here, uh, this series is, is part one of four, uh, and as you can see here on our flyer um, that uh, really explains the webinar series, you can see that our, uh, we are currently on October 10th, Planning for Life course. This is the overview. Our next uh, webinar, the part two of the series, will be on December 5th, uh, 2018, which will cover employment uses. And then the third webinar, uh, part three, will be February 6, 2019, Planning for the Life Course Post-Secondary Education and Training Uses. And uh, last but not least, on April 4th, or April 1st, excuse me, um, we will be covering independent living on the webinar series. For those of you on the webinar, I want to remind you that we are using a Zoom webinar for today's presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be archived on the patent website. Zoom has a chat feature that can be used to ask questions directly to the panel. This will be monitored by staff. In addition, there is a Q&A feature. All participants will be muted for the webinar, so please use those features um, if you have a question or concern. Act 48 and CRC are not being offered for today. If you are in need of a certificate of participation, please email Hillary um, Hillary Magnus, that is, she's our state lead at hmangus at patent.net and her information is available on this flyer and also will be available uh, at the end of the presentation um, when we present the contact information. In addition to myself, today's panel includes Devin Dyler uh, representing the PYLN. We also have Kim Rod Robinson, she's the Division Chief in Transition and Five, um, Division Chief for Transition in 511. Um, for Pennsylvania Department of Labor and Industry. Uh, also, Kelly Arnold, who is Employment Director for Pennsylvania Department of Human Services and the Office of Developmental Programs. And Amy Millar, who is Supporting Families Statewide 
Initiative Coordinator for Pennsylvania Department of Human Services and Office of Developmental Programs. Um, so at this time, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Amy uh, of the Office of Developmental Programs. And I will, let me pull up the presentation here. There you go. All right, thank you, Ryan. Um, Again, my name is Amy Millar. I am the statewide lead uh, coordinator for the Community of Practice and Supporting Families Initiative. And so I'm going to be taking you through today um, charting a life course for everyday life. Um, and so, Ryan, if you want to go to the next slide. So today I'm going to cover what is the National Community Task Force? What does that look like? What is the intent of supporting families, our fundamental uh, beliefs of the life course framework, and our life course tools. So I'm going to take you through a lot of our principles and then take you into um, the tools as well as we come through. So this is all rooted in a need for change. And there are two types of change. There's transitional change and transformational change. Transition change is kind of like um, going from step one to step two. It's a national it's a natural transition. So um, updating your iPhone, right? That's going to be a transitional change. Um, going through a promotion at work is a transitional change. Updating, merging, consolidating, reorganization. This can be very systematic. It can also be a very sterile type of change, a very predictable type of change as well. When we talk about transformational change, this is something that goes beyond that. This is completely shifting the way in which we think, um, it challenges our belief in cultural structures, our relationships and behaviors, things that aren't always easy to measure um, and or control. It's a lot more fluid, but it's also a little bit more difficult as well. It also disrupts those familiar rituals and structures. And what I equate this to is if I were to go up to you on the street and you were wearing a pair of glasses, and I came up to you and I popped those lenses out, right? You probably wouldn't be too happy with me. And I put new lenses in there. It's going to take time for you to adjust to a new lens, right? And we know that um, anyone that wears glasses, when you get a new prescription, there's an adjustment for your eyes and the way in which you see the world um, while you get adjusted. And then once you get adjusted to it, you see it in a much clearer way than you did before. And so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about transformational change. And everything that the community practice is all about is rooted in transformational change. And I'm going to take you through some of those histories. Can I go to the next slide? Okay, so this is one of my favorite personal quotes, but it says, for a seed to achieve its greatest expression, it must come completely undone. The shell cracks, its insights come out, and everything changes. For someone who doesn't understand growth, it would look a lot like complete destruction. And this is so true for that transformational change that happens. Um, it turns everything that we knew kind of upside down, and it's a complete new approach, but it's also an opportunity for great roots to take hold. Um, we know that a mighty oak tree doesn't just show up overnight, it takes time, but once, long ago, it was just a seed. Um, is Everett on the call? Because I know he had wanted to jump in here. I, I, I am. I, I am here. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Did you want to make a comment at this point, Everett? Yes. Sorry. As a... As the representative of youth from the Pennsylvania Youth Leadership Network, I <clears throat> re read this quote and it really talks about, um, in, in my head, gr growth and movement and really youth have to be pushed and we'll talk about this a little later about setting high expectations, but really trying to make sure that youth understand that growth is going to be involve change and maybe some things that are will be considered failure but in in my opinion and if you talk to youth they will tell you a lot that sometimes failure is um the best way to learn something great so growth comes when things change absolutely thank you everett 
So this is also moves us right into this, that the movement only exists when people are inspired to move, to do something, to take up causes their own. And this is so true. Without that inspirational push, none of us are motivated to change and we get stuck in that comfortability of this is the way it's always been. This is the way it will always be. Um, and I don't have an opportunity to make that any different. But when we're inspired to move and do something, that's when we can actually take it into a movement. Yeah, next slide. So the Golden Circle is a concept uh, developed by Simon Sinek. And if you have not had a chance to check out his TED Talk, I strongly encourage you to do so. Um, but essentially what he talks about is when we engage with other people around us, is that we focus on the what, right? When you meet someone, what's one of the questions you say? What do you do, right? Um, and then we go into the next part of the circle, which is how do you do that? What are the processes of that? But we rarely, it takes a long time for us to get to the why. Now, if you go to the next slide. Eight. So, oh, go back one. Okay, so, but when we focus on um, from the inner circle outward is where we can expect great movement and great change. Um, and the why is at the core of it. And when we start with the why, then we can develop the how do we get there, and then the what does that look like. But so often, so much of our system, including the support and engagement for individuals with disabilities, has been a focus on what and the how, and not so much the why. So we have to focus on the why. Next. You can go ahead to slide nine, actually, because we have gone back too many times. So this is the diffusion of innovation model. The community of practice is a movement. Um, and so this is kind of gives you an idea of what it looks like when we're talking about a substantial change to any type of model or system. So it starts with an idea. It starts with those innovators. So those fire starters, people that shake things up and go, you know what? this isn't really working. I think I have a better solution, right? And so they begin to start to develop that. But as you can see, it takes a lot and it's a very small percentage, right? And so now they might be sharing it. So we're talking about the early adopters there in the red. And this is where we share our ideas and we get more people on board, right? And so then there's some work groups and there's some people that are staying late after work to talk about this and going out and speaking to families and getting families engaged and on board, right? So these early adopters that are saying, yes, this is something I want to get on board with. Then we move into the early majority, and this is where this becomes to really take off and explode, right? This is the biggest momentum that you have. It's also the most difficult. So if you ever, if you're a trail runner or um, a cyclist and you're going, oh, just walking, right? If you are getting up a hill, those last, that final incline can be some of the most difficult things, but once we get to the top, it can be a little bit easier. Now, keep in mind that there are pressures from the late majority and those laggards. So I, the laggards, I usually use the term when I'm speaking, is that these are my concrete boot people. I'm wearing concrete boots. These are my boots. Don't you touch them. Um, this is the way it's always been. This is the way it always will be, and your idea is not going to change anything, so I am not on board, right? And that's okay, because everybody is where they are at when they are there. So whether you're in the innovation stage, early adopters, early majority, late majority, or those laggards that are really, you know, that this isn't really what they're on board with, there's pressure that's pushing back on that. So we, um, here in Pennsylvania, we are really doing a great job with this community of practice stuff in the life course is that we have engagement from most of our, um, our partners, and we have really grown a lot. And we have been reaching lots of families, and I'm going to share about that a little bit later in the presentation. This is one of my favorite slides and models to talk about, is that, you know, in the disability world, this is a civil rights movement, and there's a lot of things that have to happen. And we know, just from looking at the deinstitutionalization of individuals that's been happening over the last couple of decades, is that services and supports are evolving. If you look at the set of circles all the way to the left, we know that this applies to everyone. We are a person and individual within the context of our family, within our community. When you look in this middle slide, this is the traditional lens of disability services. So it's the person encompassed and wrapped in services, family and community. I like to say this, when I go out to Target, I do not announce 
hey, I am now entering my community. We don't speak that way. But when we speak about individuals with disabilities, we often say they are now going into the community. Especially when we talk about community participation, especially in adult services, is that this is a big part of their life of going into the community when they should be an assumed member of the community. So what does the community of practice do to combat this? What it does is it's not saying take away services. Services are necessary and needed, and quite frankly, we should have more of them available to individuals and families. But when you look at that middle slide, you can see that it creates a separation between the individual and family and the community. Not, never was the intention of it, but that's a lot of what happens sometimes. So what we're going to be talking about today is how do we integrate services and supports within the context of the person, family, and their community so that it does not create any barriers. Next, please. So, but we also know that there are a lot of pressures on this system, right? So this is where we've got um, expectations, values, federal policy. We have to consider everything, capacity of the workforce, both from um, services and support standpoint, but also um, the capacity of the workforce for individuals as well, state and federal budgets, um, and other pressures as well. And I know Kim wanted to um, speak on behalf of OVR. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. This is Kim Robinson. I hope everybody's enjoying this day so far. Um, you know, similar to the Office of Developmental Programs, OVR has also been undergoing a transition of our own, um, and a lot of that has been driven by federal legislation um, called the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Um, and I think as we go through the slides um, and you hear more about um, ODP and the um, and charting the life course, uh, I think you'll see that there are a lot of similarities between um, the direction that they're going in as well as um, the direction that OVR is going in. So a lot of the federal laws are really starting to align and come together um, and really focus on um, some pretty specific domains when it comes to uh, individuals with disabilities. Wonderful, thanks Kim. So where did this all come from? We go to the next slide on 12. This all began with the wing spread report and the link is there for you to view. Um, this is going to really give you a great sense of the foundation of where this all began. And our former Deputy Secretary Nancy Taylor was a big part of this. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about what came from this. So this was a survey that was done of stakeholders, family members, um, individuals. And what it did was identified where there was um, substantial needs and differences for individuals with disabilities. And one of the most staggering discoveries from this survey and this report was that 75% of individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities were not receiving any type of supports and services. And meant that only one in four out of the 4.7 million people were getting any type of services. And keep in mind, this doesn't mean that they were getting the right services or all of the services they were entitled to. So this is something that we really um, opened up the discussion of this has to be addressed. Can go to the next slide, please. So this also identifies where do people live. This also showed us that 89% of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities live with their families or on their own home. And yet 75% don't have any formal state services. So this tells us that those individuals are being supported by their families or not getting any type of support and this is something that needed to be addressed. And also identified where were individuals, that 25%, that where were they getting services? Some were getting them in residential settings and some are receiving them living at home as well. So this is something that really opened up the idea that something needs to change. We can't keep doing this the way we've always done it just because it's the way we've always done it because it's not working. Can you go to the next one? Um, so to give you kind of an idea to look at this lens, when we talk about, um, so say, the flu epidemic, right? Um, in the medical community, about 25% of people get 
support um, for the flu, right? So they get cared for for the flu um, through the medical system, going to the doctor's office. But that didn't account for the other 75% of our population, right? What do we do to reach them? So the development of the flu shot is something that reached another part of the majority of the community, but it's still not everybody. So as we all know, one of the things that the medical community, community has done to combat the flu epidemic is to do public service announcements, education, ensuring hand washing stations, the development of antibacterial soap, right? There are um, educational signs everywhere as we look, right? Um, there is the readiness of the flu shot. I mean, you can't go into a Target without um, them chasing you down for a flu shot, right? So these are creative ways that are transformational change that allow the medical community to reach everybody at large at some level, even if they weren't coming in the actual doors of the doctor's office. Next slide. So when we bring that idea back, I want you to look at this slide where if you look at that orange slice of this, that's the eligibility-based support, and this is where people are getting services, right? Just like the doctor's office. So what are some things that we can develop and strategies to reach more of the community? So in that central part, which would represent that readiness of the flu shop, this is the development of family and self-advocacy support networks. Simplifying the front door system. How do people get identified to come in for services? How are each county operating? Can we uniform that system in our state? Giving families a different positive narrative, right? Instead of, I remember when my son was diagnosed with autism, I felt like um, it's a casserole kind of a thing. Like there's been a death, a death of your future, right? Um, when a diagnosis comes that you weren't expecting. Everybody makes you a casserole. <laughs> So we want to give families a different narrative, a positive narrative of high expectation. This is not a casserole kind of situation. <laughs> um, we want to do inclusive education with supports, adaptive equipment, and problem solving and life navigation in order to support individuals and families. Now, the other part of it that we can reach everyone is universally changing our culture and our accessibility in our community. Let's think about the development of those family restrooms. They support all people. Um, even if you're living in a multi-generational home, it allows access to that. Training for EMT and police of how to be knowledgeable and supportive of an individual with uh, developmental disabilities. Making sure that um, recreational and spiritual um, avenues are accessible. So these are all things that we can be doing and working together that doesn't necessarily replace the need for services, but supports the individual and family while they're not getting that. So from the Windspread Report became, be, became the National Community Practice Supporting Families Through the Lifespan. And the Supporting Families Initiative is what really came from this. So this began in 2012 with six states. Missouri was um, the head of that. And they developed a life course framework and tools that we'll talk about a little bit later. In 2016, um, 11 more states joined, which when you think about government change and systems change, a four-year span for them to go from six states to 17 states that participate in this and say, yes, we want to be a part of it, that's exponential growth. Um, each state has a partnership with their DD agencies and DD council, and it's been a wonderful thing to experience here in Pennsylvania. I am a, a committee member of the DD council here in Pennsylvania, and so um, and have been a part of the community of practice since Pennsylvania joined in 2016. So it's been a really cool experience for me to experience it from both lenses and as a family member. So, and then we get to share and collaborate. In fact, we have a national call over this afternoon where we get to talk to our national team and learn from our other states as well. This is a map that shows the states that are included, Hawaii as well, although I always like to tease them at national conferences, but they can't complain about anything because <laughs> they're coming from Hawaii. I'm still waiting for them to host our uh, annual meeting. Um, but so far, they have not offered that. 
So, um, so what does that look like in Pennsylvania for our participation? So here in Pennsylvania, we developed the PA Family Network, which I'm going to speak in a little bit more detail a little bit later. We've also created a launch of regional collaboratives across our state of Pennsylvania, and there's a lot of exciting things happening there. We support self-advocates united as one, and we're working with them to build more local chapters and groups. We continue to uphold and teach the concepts of person-centered thinking and planning, and we are a supporter of the PA Sibling Support Network and their ambassadors because we believe that siblings often become the default support person for individuals with disabilities, and siblings need support as well. We want to make sure that our waivers reflect the language um, and support families in everyday life. And we're continuing to learn and share from the families that we're connected to. So the regional collaboratives consist of counties, our supports coordinator organizations, CERT and ODP staff, ID and Autism, the Bureau of Autism included, and regional and central office staff. We also um, invite other human services programs to participate and also um, broad spectrums of the community partners as well. So some of our collaboratives engage um, with their children and youth um, departments. We have um, individuals in the Northeast that come from uh, the juvenile justice system. We also have a lot of uh, participation from schools and IU staff, and even local businesses and family members as well. So it's very, um, it's, it's a real incredible thing to experience together. Go to the, the next slide. So this is a map of Pennsylvania, and these are in the colored um, counties, are counties that participate as a collaborative for the community of practice. We have 67 counties in our state of that. 60 counties and county joiners have or are in the process of joining a collaborative at this time. So when you think about that, that's about a 90% participation across our state where your county offices and your um, administrative entities are saying, yes, we want to be a part of this and support those that are living in our county with the life course and set high expectations and a vision and a um, we really want to support families in this way. So it's a really exciting thing in Pennsylvania that is unlike um, anything else in the country at this time. Um, like I had mentioned, the PA Family Network is a huge part of this. And so this cons um, consists of 25 family advisors across the state that go out into the community and offer um, workshops and one-on-one -on -one mentoring. This is free for families. There is no intake process. There is no um, pre-qualification um, or wait list for you to have a mentoring session. All you have to do is reach out. Um, their email is there. And at the end of the presentation, there will also be information of how to get in touch with them. They can come and speak to your group. They can do workshops. And they can also do one-on-one -on -one mentoring. One of the really interesting workshops that they do is on transition for families. So during that transition planning, um, and you're doing that with someone that has lived life experience as well. Cool. So um, here we also want to point out that this is also in collaboration with our efforts in Pennsylvania to support in everyday lives. There will be another everyday lives um, conference in 2019, and we hope that um, many of you will join us at that. Go to the next slide, please. So these are the um, values and principles of everyday lives. And number four is the supports the family throughout the lifespan. And that really aligns itself with the community of practice. And there is a link there for you to visit. So the life course principles, there are eight essential uh, principles to the life course. And the one we kind of talked about is the idea that this is for all people. Um, it is imperative that we reach beyond that 25%. We need to be impacting 100% of those that um, have intellectual and developmental disabilities. And, and really, honestly, all families in Pennsylvania need support. We really focus on the... Oh, can you go back real quick? 
um, on the family systems and cycles. It's very important that we focus on the individual and the family and that we pay attention to those natural cycles. So when the eldest child who may have been a major support for morning routines goes off to college, what does that look like? Or when there's a divorce or a death in the family. We also want to focus on the life stages and the trajectory, setting those big and grand visions for our lives, focusing on life outcomes. What is it that we want for our life in each of those areas? I'm going to speak briefly in a little bit about the life domain. Also, the three buckets. We believe at the core that there are three areas in which families need their buckets filled up. I'm going to speak to that in a little bit. And integrating our supports, which remember when I talked at that circle slide, that this is about taking it from just giving you services to looking at this in an integrated way of the different types of support that are in an individual's life. And then also that we're engaging with policies and systems and breaking down silos and making sure that our policies and our regulations reflect um, the support of the life course and an everyday life for all. Can you go to the next one? So this comes into the framework. So we have our principles, and then we have our framework. And then this is all about, these are just conversation starters. These are problem solvers. Um, the framework really encourages the creation and ownership of a vision of an everyday life and can be used by anyone in any setting. We've seen organizations use this as a supervision tool. We've also seen this um, in our community partnerships and our collaboratives, utilizing it for them to set their vision for how they want to participate at the county level um, to engage with more families as well. And it focuses on all stages of life of the life. So this can be used in early intervention. This can be used from birth. This can be used um, all the way up into our final years. In fact, my family um, used this with my grandfather, who's 99, to talk about some of um, his uh, end-of-life care and what his everyday life looks like and making sure that his vision is at the forefront of his care. So um, here is the framework, and usually we kind of are able to build it, but it starts with that center focus of the individual in the center of the circle, encompassed in their family and their community. The third ring out are those life domains. So these are the um, areas of our life where we can break it up into categories. So daily life and employment, what do I do during the daytime? Um, social and spirituality, how am I connected to my community and other people? Health and safety, um, or safety and security is uh, emergency preparedness, personal safety, um, combating abuse, but also um, taking care of ourselves as well in that, in that regard. Community living, where do I live and who do I live with? Healthy living, this is our wellness as well. And our citizenship and advocacy, where do I fit into my community? What role am I playing? That next ring, that fourth ring, is all about those three bucket areas, which is discovery and navigation. Where do I go for information that I need? Um, green is connecting and networking. Who can I talk to that's been there before? Who's the parent that knows where um, there's a dentist that will handle a child that has um, some complex needs that it might not be able, um, to, has not been able to have success with other dentists? Goods and services, these are actual services and supports that we need. Um, and then that outer ring is those integrated supports, a person's personal strengths and assets. Relationship-based refers to like who's in your village. Eligibility specific is those actual services that we qualify for, but this also can be voter registration, on uh, driver's license, things like that, not necessarily in the disability system. Community-based, where am I connected in my community? Um, as far as even volunteer opportunities or just engagement, technology, what technology is in my life that can help support me towards my goals? Now, these are the life domains. So we have, again, daily life and employment. And Kim's going to speak a little bit in a moment um, from OVR's perspective. And then, like I mentioned, community living is all about where we live. These are living options, um, social and spirituality, our friends, relationships, leisure, healthy living is our medical behavioral needs, um, nutrition, safety and security, emergency, well-being, legal rights, 
Citizenship and advocacy is our valued role in making choices, setting good responsibility and leadership and peer support. So Kim? Um, so again, um, just to, you know, just to point out, there are so many um, similarities and so, um, so many opportunities for us all to collaborate um, between OVR and ODP and education. Um, so under WIOA, um, we have services called pre-employment transition services, and there are five services um, that we really focus in on, um, and they they actually are very similar to these everyday life domains. Um, so uh, we talk about workplace readiness training. So workplace readiness um, can also encompass it can encompass like those social and uh, communication skills and, and those skills to maintain employment. Um, but we also have um, some focus on independent living skills as well. So uh, while Amy was talking about, um, you know, things like getting a driver's license and learning how to be out in the community, those are also uh, important skills under pre-employment transition services, um, understanding how to take public transportation, understanding uh, how to get your photo ID. Um, we also, um, excuse me, we of course have a huge emphasis on employment being uh, from vocational rehab and we're really working hard to do as much as we can to get uh, students out into work, what we call work-based learning experiences and focusing on uh, learning about what it's like to be in a community uh, employment setting. Um, we also, uh, the third um, domain or, or service under pre-employment transition services is self-advocacy instruction. So we really um, want to do everything we can to prepare students at a young age to not only um, understand their disability, but understand um, what it means to have a disability, be able to advocate for themselves, uh, and ask for help. And um, to understand what resources are out there in the community. Um, we also focus on um, post-secondary options and, and finding out what kind of training programs are out there. Um, and I am blanking on our last service. Um, I think you can really see how the pre-employment transition services really um, kind of closely align with these everyday life domains and a lot of the work that the three agencies are doing um, can really come together and align and there's lots of opportunities for us all to collaborate to build better programs and better networks for our students. Um, you know, especially as we're talking about um, OVR, uh, being at more IEP meetings and um, enjoying more of this life, more of this planning, I think the everyday life domains really fit well into IEPs as well as the, the free employment transition services. And I think, like I said, I think there's lots of opportunities for us to collaborate. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, Ryan, can you go to the next one? Okay. So these are those three buckets that I was talking about, and these really fall under a recommendation of the four of everyday lives. And it focuses on the fact that the vast majority of people with disabilities in Pennsylvania do live with their families. So families need to have support in order to make an everyday life possible. And so like I had mentioned earlier, um, the three buckets are, are divided into discovery and navigation. And this is where do I go for information and trainings? Even this webinar would be in that kind of a bucket. Connecting and networking, it's really about talking to someone that's been there, going, being able to go to your county and say, hey, I'm really needing to connect with someone on this part of our life that we're going through, can you help me? And it's also networking and building up the fact that we're not alone in this. And a lot of times it can feel that way. I know for myself as a parent, with three children that all of whom have um, significant challenges. Um, my oldest daughter has about eight different specialists um, and several disorders. She's my alphabet soup kid, as I call it. We've got every acronym <laughs> listed for her. And I often, as a parent, just wanted to be able to talk to somebody that knew what it was like to go through what we were going through just to encourage me as well as get some information from a parent perspective, not just the system. And then goods and services is listening to them of what is it that we actually need um, for that day-to-day -day life. Is it medical, financial and supports, um, adaptive equipment, things like that. 
um, getting getting on the wait list, doing our puns, things like that. So these are the things that we try to focus on when we're meeting with families, especially through the, through the PA Family Network when they're mentoring a family, is trying to discern what does this family need? Which bucket has a critical need to be filled up at this time? We can go to the next one. So this is a great quote um, by Eric Carter, and again, the link is there for the full article, but the most powerful force in changing transition outcomes for young people with significant disabilities now ultimately found the transition plans we craft, the educational services we offer, the instructions we provide of the systems we build, but rather in the expectations and aspirations individual parents hold for their sons and daughters. All these other efforts are no doubt essential, but absent families equipped with a clear and compelling vision for what is a good life after high school were missing something utterly essential. For years, I thought, as someone who had worked in the system most of my career, I thought, I'm going to have the best IEP. I know my rights. I know the law. I know all of this. I crafted the best IEPs for my children, best medical care plans with my daughter's doctors. And you know what? It was very important, but at the end of the day, me setting high expectations for them had such a more critical impact. And when I read this article for the first time a couple of years ago, it really helps me understand that. And it allows me in my role now as I support families to really encourage them that they have such a powerful opportunity to equip their children to be successful just by setting those bars very high for them. Their aspirations. Ever did you want to um, interject here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was reading this quote, and I have to be honest that I'm sitting here now as what my mother would call a very successful young professional who works at a community college supporting an inclusive higher ed initiative and focusing on a college campus of accessibility. Um, but um, there was a point in my life where I strongly disliked my mother <laughs> in a positive way because she would set such high expectations um, for me. My mother, by trade, is a job trainer for a local intermediate unit. And um, so you can imagine that she's been doing that now for over 20 years. So as I've aged, um, she learned early on about services and supports that were available. We talked about those buckets a little earlier. My mom uh, got really connected to other parent groups and other resources um, and learned quickly um, from other parents that setting high expectations was was essential. So I was, but I was also, um, I could say this in a nice way now, was made um, to join work programs and to explore options and try things um, that I hated, that I now look back and say, um, if it wasn't for my mom uh, setting those high expectations for me, I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. And even though if you are out there as a educator or family member, if you're thinking about this, um, pushing people to the next level or pushing your son or daughter to the next level could literally open doors to them that they didn't know um, were possible. And my mom and I now can look back and laugh um, because of where those high expectations have taken taken me personally. But um, we talked about WIOA services before my job at the college. I actually was supervising other uh, coaches, uh, other like that were doing work experiences and job shadowing and doing travel training and independent living skills instruction. So um, I have taken my mother's passion for setting high expectations and try to do that now and impart that as a person with disability myself on the students that I work with every day now. And so, um, so I just say again, for your students that might be upset, um, that might resist, um, they have to be in charge of their own future and make their own decisions, but giving them opportunities to set high expectations and, and believe in them, um, is really, really important. Thank you, Everett. So when we take this into consideration, we also have to remember that expectations are formed early and over time, and they shape our experiences and vice versa. And expectations are influenced by our opportunities and support. We all know that, that that can have such a high impact in this. 
You know the next one? Okay, so when we take that, what we've learned, where do we go from here? And we know at our core that we have to connect families with ordinary examples of what's possible. I remember thinking about um, that it is so vital that while it's great to hear these one in a million stories of success, right? Like they had an idea and they turned it into multi-million dollar um, entrepreneurship. There was a time in my life where that meant nothing to me. I just wanted to figure out how I could get through the day that my son wasn't going to loop from school and be safe. Um, and so I needed to hear about just those everyday examples of, uh, of an everyday life that was possible. And we have to invest in those high expectations. And we've got to catch and communicate this collective vision that, yes, you have a right to an everyday life. And, yes, you need to set the bar high. And we're going to hold the system accountable and our community accountable to uplift that as well. Yeah. And we have to let parents challenge um, our own expectations and experiences as professionals as well. So why is it so important to have a vision for a good life? Because it sets the dream, the positive expectation for the future. Without a vision, there's no expectation of what that's going to look like. And it also opens up the opportunity that if we don't design a vision for our life, that someone else is going to instill um, their own expectations for us and put us in boxes. I like to share my own personal story at this point uh, that when I was um, in school, one of the challenges that I have is that I have um, a processing delay and I have dyslexia. Um, and I, at the time, and I still to this day sometimes struggle when my brain kind of um, hasn't caught up, sometimes I will um, have a stutter. Um, as I'm processing information. And when I was in school, I really wasn't being taught in the way in which I learned. And so I struggled in school. My grades were not good. Um, I used to go, back then you went out in the back into the trailer. That's where you got support. Um, and now I'm so glad to see less and less schools doing that. And um, there was a time when I was a junior, I had signed up for the college tour because that's what all of my peers were doing, right? That's a natural thing that happens as a high school junior is that you're getting ready for that next stage. And I signed up for the college tour and my college uh, guidance counselor stopped me in the hallway and I'll never forget it. Um, his sweater, his bad breath. <laughs> um, I will never forget that experience where he told me that, um, you know, Amy, you're, you're not going to college. And um, the bus is full, and we have another student that would like to go on the tour that um, has an opportunity to go to college. And I, you really just, you're not going to get there, so there's no point in you going on this tour. And I remember being crushed by this. And one of the things that he said to me was, you know, just go play your sports. Just go play your sports. Well, you know what? I did. And when I was a senior, I was recruited by a college recruiter. Um, for my skills in field hockey. But the recruiter even said, hey, listen, these grades are a problem. And the fact was that here I was, a high school senior, operating at about a third grade reading level. Um, and so they sent me to a progressive, brand new program that the university had designed back then, which was geared at allowing students with disabilities the opportunity to um, learn in a higher educational setting. And so I went and I spent three months that summer um, with, a, um, with support staff and I played my sports in the evening and I learned all day during the summer. And by the end of that summer, because I had finally been taught in the way in which I learned, I was able to decode language for the first time in my life and be able to read and comprehend things that I had been missing for essentially the 12 years that I was in um, school. I would not be here today, and I would not have gotten my college degree had I not had that personal strength and asset as an athlete. And so I really strongly encourage families and professionals that it is so important to have those high expectations and a vision for a good life because if we don't have that, if we don't have that, we put people in boxes and we limit what's possible for them. Had I not had that skill, I can guarantee I wouldn't be working where I am today and living the life in which I've chosen to design for my life. So we can go to the next slide. 
Awesome. So this is also our core belief is that all people follows up with that have the right to live, love, work, play, and pursue their life aspirations in their community. This is about the all, not people with disabilities. All people have this inherent right. Can you go to the next slide? So, and this also encompasses the fact that the future is not something we enter, the future is something that we create, and creating that future requires us to make choices and decisions that begin with a dream. Not the best transition plan, but a dream. And so it's such a powerful thing that we have to remember that. We can go to the next slide. This also is really important that all of this exists within the context of family. And for so long, when we thought about supporting individuals, we forget about the context of family. And family is designed by that person. Um, and they're going to need support, but a just as roles and needs of everybody in the family changes. And that um, it really shouldn't also depend on where they live. Now, there's two little boys here in the larger picture to the right on the dance floor. Um, the one boy holding that um, circle ring in his hand, that's my son, Noah. Uh, Noah has autism and Tourette's, and that's his best friend, Robert. Um, I always talk about Robert like a son of mine because Robert was my son's first authentic friend. Um, not because I was at an autism support group, but because they found each other eating wood chips under a slide one day. And, <laughs> um, and ever since then, they've been inseparable. Well, there was an opportunity for a dance at the school. And I was super excited. The idea was, um, it was called a special person's dance. And this replaced like the traditional like daddy-daughter dance where it was meant for each student to bring like that parental role person in their life to the dance. And so I was super excited. I was, and anyone who knows me in real life knows I love to get dressed up. I love dresses. And so I was super excited. I found that outfit, no itchy tags. I was super excited to go to the dance with him. And he came home from school and he was just having a horrible day. And a massive fit. And Robert's father called me and said, hey, are you guys going to the dance? And I said, you know, I don't know. We're having a really hard time and I can't figure out what happened. There's nothing in the behavioral um, log. There's, you know, I, I can't seem to get an answer out of him, but he's just a mess. And then it dawned on me. And I looked at my son who was having a complete meltdown on the kitchen floor. And I said, Noah, who did you want to take to the dance? And he screamed at me, Robert, and you're ruining everything. <laughs> and here I was thinking that I'm this great advocate. I'm all about supporting families and individuals. And I just assumed I knew what my son was going to choose as his special person. And it wasn't me. <laughs> it was Robert. And so, um, and it was funny because Robert had also been having a hard time. And so we did let the boys go to the dance together and we sat on the sideline and they had a great time. And it was an opportunity that could have been lost just because I hadn't even stopped to ask him who was the special person in his life. And it was Robert. So it's always a reminder for me in this role and as a parent advocate myself is that we have to remember that the person gets to design who is their special person, who is their family, who is their village. Um, and it's a big part of this. We can go to the next slide, talking about family roles. So the interesting thing is that when we think back to that slide about how 25% are getting services and 75% are not, there are two roles that happen between that parent-child dynamic, and it's that caring about and caring for. So the caring about goes on for our whole life, that affection, um, the passing down of knowledge, a lifetime commitment kind of stuff, right? Caring for is that day-to-day -day care. And just like from a newborn into development, the natural role is that that caring for you start to step away as independence grows. But when you have a disability, a lot of times that role continues. And so we want to make sure that we're supporting the family so that caregivers and parents and siblings are able to hang out in that caring about section more than the caring for. So now I'm going to take you guys through um, for the last part of the presentation about what are the actual tools that we use. So these are all conversation starters, problem solvers, all about that future and that strong vision. Ownership of the vision it can be used by anyone in any setting. Like I said before, it can be used as a supervisory tool, um, but it's a really great part, and we're seeing a lot of um, schools and um, 
other other services that are using these as they support families and individuals. Um, and so, and ever, I'm going to give you a chance to talk about the tools. I just want to go through them real quick. Um, sure. So we can go to the next slide. So these are the three different tools that we utilize, and it's a one-page profile. Um, what do people like and admire about me? What sets me apart? What's important to me and the best way to support me? The life trajectory. What has been happening in my life to support my vision? What's been happening that doesn't support my vision? Where do I want to go and where do I want to avoid? The Integrated Services and Support Star is all about exploring and discovering what are the actual supports in an individual's life that might not necessarily be just services through offices like ODP or OVR or other avenues. So this is the profile here, and um, it's a very simple tool. I joke a lot of times for my son that this is, um, I use this mostly with substitute teachers for him in the classroom setting, right? Because a substitute teacher isn't going to have enough time to, to look through an IEP or behavioral modification plan, right? She's there for six and a half hours. So, but this is a quick 30 second blip about my son, about what's really awesome about him, what engages him, what's important to him, and how can she support him in that classroom setting. Um, it's a great snap it, snippet. And long ago, we used to have a problem with him um, biting people in the face um, as a communication, um, which is not a desired way to communicate. Nope. Um, so I used to joke that if you don't want to be bit in the face, please read. <laughs> and um, because if you could engage with my son and, and, and connect with him about what's important to him and what's really awesome about him and support him in the ways that work instead of just shooting a dart in the dark, um, you're going you're gonna to be able to engage him. And it also decreases his um, undesired behaviors as well. So this is the trajectory. And like I said, in the top right, you have that vision. And it's the biggest bubble, right? Because it's the biggest part of this. What does my good life look like in every avenue? My education, my relationships, my career, where I live, what I want to be doing with my leisurely time. Um, my son loves the color red, and um, on his he put, um, have all things red, but not too much, so I don't lose an appreciation of other colors. Um, and so I think that that was just a really cool thing about him, but um, this can be as simple as that, or this could be, I want to be an engineer doing this, this, and that, right? It can be anything that they want. But we also want to make sure we identify what I don't want in my life. Because if we don't give a name to it, we're going to end up there. And then this also gives an opportunity to look at what's happened in the past and what might be coming up that's putting us towards their vision or taking us away from there. And then finally, this is the integrated services and support star. And so this is where we can list those personal strengths and assets up there, are they great problem solvers? Do they have a keen sense of be, be able to read people? Things like that. Um, are they really good with puzzles? Relationship-based, who's in my corner in my village? Um, is it the neighbor? Is it, um, you know, an aunt or an uncle that's very involved in your life? Big sister or big brother? Eligibility, again, are services, but not just in the disability world. This is anything that you are um, oh, I just got knocked out of the meeting. Just give me a second. There we go. Um, so this is, um, again, so that can be your driver's license, anything that you qualify. This could be a TransPass program. This is also where we could talk about like the seventh grade initiative with the YMCAs. Anything that you're eligible for, based on something that you meet the requirement for. Community-based is your YMCAs, your fire stations, um, community centers, um, folk festival organizations, anything like that in the community. Technology could be as simple as your alarm clock that helps you get up in the morning. Your Apple Watch with reminders of when to take your break and to come back from your break when you're working and transitioning. Homework reminders, online portals. Anything that is in our life with technology. And then in the center of the star, we typically put a goal or an area that we're trying, like a problem that we're trying to solve. I use this a lot when I think about um, 
you know, problem solving around like childcare for when I travel. I have a single parent of three children. So I can look and see, you know, what strengths of my children can I tap into to help support this? What technology can we use? We utilize FaceTime a lot with my kids. Relationship-based, which neighbors can I count on? Um, my babysitter, but also my, my neighbor across the street who sometimes doesn't, she doesn't work on Thursday. She works from home on Thursday. So sometimes on Thursdays I can count on her. So that's the kind of things that we're talking about with the star. So we go to the next one. Ryan, could you go to the next slide? I um, I did. Oh. Are you not seeing it? Okay, there we go. So, um, sorry, there was a delay on my part. So, again, the benefits of the one-page profile is here, especially when we're talking about in an educational setting, is that students have the opportunity to share and really take ownership and pride about what sets them apart and what's important to them and the best ways to support them in a classroom setting. It's very brief, but it's an effective way to introduce them to staff and to substitutes. Um, doing it as a staff is an, an avenue for you to have dialogue and increase everybody's sense of value to your team and a way to effectively work together. Um, I have done this in, in, in my work with others with ODP and with the PA Family Network. And for me, with someone who does have some language-based um, challenges, this was a great tool for me to kind of share that with those that work with me of where I have needs. So written material, I need a little bit more time than the average person to review them because it takes me a little more time to process the information in the way in which I decode language. Um, this is a way to also empower the family to have open dialogue during team meetings. Um, it's a great way to just have it all together. And what I love about this is you don't see anywhere where it asks for the diagnosis, right? This isn't deficiency focus. This is strength focused. If we go to the next one, this is the trajectory. And the, the, the great thing about this for students is that it allows them to really share what are their long-term goals? What's important to them in the long run? Um, and it also gives us a timeline of the past, the current, and future experiences that may or may not be leading them towards their vision. It gives us an opportunity to see like, wow, this is what's happened to them in the past, and where, what can we do with that? It also, again, increases that open dialogue during meetings to communicate, hey, for our family, this is where we're headed. This is what we want. These are our high expectations. And this is also where we can create a path to assist families to set those high expectations, dream big, and communicate what they don't want for their children as well. So again, this is all about what my vision is and what I don't want, and this can be done at every life stage. So whether you're a year old or you're 99, you can still be setting the vision for what's to come and what you don't want for your life. Go to the next. So this is also a big part of it, that life experiences are a huge part of it, and we want to make sure that people have the opportunity to live life. Um, to, to do the arts and dance and, and playing with neighborhood friends and camping and cooking and chores. These are all a huge part of building those high expectations and setting us towards what we do want. You know, the next. And this also, remember, opportunities in relationship have a huge part of it. So we want to make sure that families and individuals and um, even in our school setting, our supports people have the opportunity to um, explore new avenues and relationships and foster those and encourage those relationships. Everett, did you want to talk just briefly about how you guys have been using the tools? Yeah, sure. So um, for those of you that are veterans of the transition commerce that has happened every summer for like the past 15 years, um, PYLM has done numerous, um, it used to just be sessions for youth, but over the last um, three or four years, we have really done sessions that are focused on youth and family partnerships. And we have found that the life course tools are really, really fun to use um, with youth and families. How we have done it in particular is um, had the youth go in one room and the families go in the other, because you know that youth are oftentimes much more uh, honest about things. 
um, when their parents might not always be around and they're around a, a group of their peers or what is perceived, um, to, you know, they, they believe that we're not going to tell mom and dad. But what we do is, um, in particular, we use the one pager and the star. Um, but the one pager, we have the youth fill out the one pager on their own. Um, and if they need support, we provide that to them. Um, but, uh, and then we have the family members also fill it out from the perspective of what they think their child might say or what they see. And what, the, and what that does is it kind of allows them, and then we bring them back together uh, as a youth and family uh, to discuss the differences and the similarities. And we have often heard youth and families say that using these tools has allowed them to leave that hour and 15 minute session with some plans um, to be, be able to adapt and change things to maybe um, be doing and addressing things that the youth find to be most important. Because sometimes there's some disconnect there between what the family perceives or what a parent perceives and what the youth actually wants and desires. And so, um, and, and you're right that those tools are so simple to use uh, and um, really easy for people to grasp what they mean and it's really a great way to do real person-centered thinking. Awesome, thank you so much. So again, um, just to kind of close about the tools is that those experiences and those natural life transitions that happen in life are a huge integral part of it as well. Can we go to the next one? And we have to remember that the trajectory isn't always straight, is that things are going to happen, life is going to happen and smack us in the face from time to time. There could be a family upset, there could be a diagnosis of cancer and a primary care provider, this could be divorce, or this could be um, changing schools, or this could be an injury or a new diagnosis. I know for my own daughter, we had a um, substantial health crisis last year that landed her in the ICU for a while. And that really took us off course for a little bit. But it's not a life sentence. We can get back on track. We can keep focusing on our lifetime goals. And that they don't have to become life sentences when we do get off track. We have the opportunity to turn it around. And that's what Life Course is all about, is meeting families where they're at, supporting what their long-term goals are, and giving them the support that they need, even if it's not in just eligibility-specific services. Um, again, just to reiterate with the STAR, this is a little out of order, I apologize, but um, this is again all about the specific goal settings, where we can increase those supports if we're lacking some, and again, make sure that we're talking about what general supports might help a student and a family as they're transition planning for the future um, to help support their goals. One of the other resources that the um, community of practice and life course have to offer families and individuals is this experiences and questions booklet. And the thing is, we don't have all the answers, but we have a lot of the questions. So when you look at this resource, and the link is there for you, is that you can see at each life stage, okay, when I'm thinking about employment and I have an 11-year-old, what are some of the questions I should be asking right now? Maybe I have an older brother that's 48 and um, has just transitioned back to living in the community. Um, what questions should I be asking? So this is a really great resource. This. So again, in closing, I just want to reiterate that the life course framework is all about the individual at the core, their family, how they live their life in their life domain, what is it that they need, and what supports do they have to get them there. I want to briefly share one of the resources that ODP offers is the My ODP website. We now have um, surpassed over 50,000 users, and this is a free resource to families with trainings and access to information and bulletins from the Office of Developmental Programs. So just wanted to put that in there as a resource, and there's a lot on the life course there as well. In closing, I just want to share um, a quick story about setting those high expectations. And, and I want to preference this that I was once asked um, by a provider, what do I do when families have un un unrealistic expectations? And I say, I don't understand the question. 
I don't think there are unrealistic expectations when we're talking about a life plan for someone. So you help them get there. They want to be mayor, then you start small. Get them registered to vote, right? And we work on that goal. And so this is a story about an individual that kept saying, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be an astronaut. Their whole life, I want to be an astronaut. And many children go up and say, I want to be an astronaut, right? And what do adults say to them? Well, isn't that nice? <laughs> um, and so this was happening in this individual's life. And then finally, um, you know, a support worker said, you know what, tell me, tell me more about why you want to be an astronaut. Well, I just think the suit is amazing. And I, I just really want to wear that suit. Well, that's cool. Um, what else? Well, I love talking about the solar system and, and the planets and the stars. And I just love sharing that information. So well, that's good. And I said, what else? And they said, what about, you know, being launched in the space shuttle? And they were like, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want anything to do with that. And they realized that he was an individual that kept talking about that they wanted to be an astronaut. But they didn't want to go into space. And so this support worker was able to figure out that there was a way to make this dream happen for this individual. And that was by getting a job at the planetarium got the individual spacesuit, and he shares every day about the planets with other people. And he's living his dream. He has the job that he wanted to have. In fact, it's not a job. It's his lifelong mission to be an astronaut. So in the next slide, and this is a great tweet that says, my three-year-old said she wanted to be an astronaut. I said she had to study hard, go to college, learn a lot of science, and take a physical fitness test. And she shrugged and said, eh, that's just worth things. So she's basically a nonchalant motivational speaker. So this is something to keep in mind is that sometimes when we think that it's too high or unrealistic to someone else, it's not. It's obtainable. And I do want to give Kim an opportunity to talk in a second about the ways in which OVR um, reaches out and supports families. Um, but I do want to encourage you um, after this webinar to reach out to us. We're here to help individuals and families that are transitioning in the educational system and looking at those next steps for their, um, the young people in their life. So please connect with us afterwards. So Kim? Sure. Um, thanks, Amy. Uh, I just wanted to, to give a couple plugs for uh, some of the OBR programs as well um, that outreach to, to families and parents. Um, we have early reach coordinators in each of our district offices. Um, part of their role is to do outreach, um, and they would be more than happy to come and talk to parent groups, um, do training series for parents, um, and, you know, reach out to me, reach out to your local district office. Um, we'll be happy to, to set you up with, um, with somebody from Early Reef. And, and we also have the, um, the Parent uh, Family Engagement Project that's happening um, in, I guess, Midwestern Pennsylvania. It's in the Newcastle area. Um, we have regular evening series for parents and students. Um, we, uh, generally, there's a topic and then there's a, a, a meal. Um, that follows. Um, we have various speakers that come in. We also have some OVR staff that attend as well. So it's a great way to learn about transition um, as well as OVR. So thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much. So in closing, when we're talking about the community of practice and life course here in Pennsylvania, we have a statewide team. Myself, again, my name is Amy Millar. Um, and I work for ODP. Um, my email is there. And then in each of our regions of our state, we have regional leads as well. And Lisa Tuffler heads up our PA family network. Um, like I mentioned, there are free, 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 free um, family mentoring sessions available as well as workshops. And then those are our three main websites that have resources that um, were mentioned in today's presentation. So I hope that this was helpful. Um, and um, I'm very grateful to be a part of this, and I look forward to the remaining parts of the webinar series.